We continue through one of the 20th century's masterpieces, Kane by Gene Toomer, playlist for a discussion on every item below. Today, we're talking about the two poems, Face and Cotton Song. Hair, silver gray, like streams of stars. Brows, recurved canoes, quivered by the ripples blown by pain. Her eyes, mist of tears, condensing on the flesh below and her channeled muscles are cluster grapes of sorrow, purple in the evening sun, nearly ripe for worms. A very uplifting poem by Gene Toomer. <laughs> but what do we think about this poem? Is it simple, stylistically? Like, when we look at it, how many lines are there? 13 lines, not too bad. The structure, well, there's lots of pauses, right? It's kind of like hair, silver gray, brows, recurve canoes and it's like this pause where we go to the woman leave and then almost like come back to it so what is happening with this poem we're describing an elderly woman right she's got silver gray hair and what kind of a life has she had right they talked about her brows being like recurved canoes so this is a very poetic way of describing that she's sad right she's frowning i guess in a sense and she's frowning because of pain meaning that she's had some hardships, some loss. Something has caused her to feel upset. And channeled muscles are like a cluster of grapes. Not sure how you took that, but, you know, when I think of cluster of grapes, I start to think of, like, knots in muscles, right? Like, like almost like you've been working so hard. Like, I had this muscle pain in my neck once, and it's like I lost control of my arm for a whole day. This story a little bit more serious, but it's the idea that they've gone through, to me, that they've gone through so much work that there's these knots, this sorrow, this loss. And now we're at a time of death where we're looking back at our life and we haven't, you know, have, do we feel like we've, we're talking about accomplishments? We're talking more about this negative state in a very simple way with tumor. And it makes me wonder, you know, where, where are we supposed to connect as a reader with this one? In the story that we just came out of with Becky, we had a woman who had a lot of hardships and it's almost like so much of the judgment in that story, Becky had to do with society placing expectations, uh, demands upon an individual. Well, here we just get almost kind of like, it feels almost like a woman who has gone through a lifetime of that. She's now a husk where we don't even know what her dreams are, what her hopes are, what she was, what would make her happy. We just have like this, these descriptions of a physical husk, almost like when an animal molts its skin. You have her silver gray hair, her, her frown on her face, her muscles that look uh, clustered. And it makes you think about how maybe society can wear down on a person, how it empties the hole within you. And it makes you question too, like what is the purpose of life, right? Because this kind of dovetails, as do a lot of these, these initial poems to particularly, perfectly into the next poem, which is Cotton Song. And I will read this in my regular voice, not with the vernacular in which it is written. Come, brother, come, let's lift it. Come now, Hewitt, roll away. Shackles fall upon the judgment day, but let's not wait for it. God's bodies got a soul. Bodies like to roll the soul. Can't blame God if we don't roll. Come, brother, roll, roll. Cotton bales are the fleecy way. Weary sinners bare feet trod. Softly, softly to the throne of God. We ain't gonna wait until the judgment day. Nah, sir, nah, sir, hump. Eh ho, eh ho, roll away. We ain't gonna wait until the judgment day. God's body's got a soul. Bodies like to roll the soul. Can't blame God, as we don't roll. Come, brother, roll, roll. So the style of this one, much more complex, particularly when we compare it to the previous poem in terms of the grammar, in terms of the length, in terms of even the word choice. Uh, syllables, you know, we do get up to three syllables once, but most of them are two syllables, not too bad. But there's simply this movement, this style throughout all of Cain. And even critic H. William Rice talks about in his sh short essay, Two Work Songs, where he talks about how this book will move from simple to complex and back again. And what does that do? What does that stir up in a reader is what I would ask you. Because when we look at the narrator, particularly for this one, who is it, right? Is he one of the workers that's working his life away, right? He says, we ain't gonna wait till judgment day. And that we implies that he also 
is one of these workers, right? These people who, who are spending their lives producing for others, kind of in the, in the way that we talked about in the previous woman, she was a husk, an empty soul, where we don't know what her life was like or what her dreams, her ambitions were. Well, here we have some other individuals that are working the life, and we do get to see that they don't want to wait till Judgment Day. They don't want to keep working this hard lifestyle only to end up that husk where who knows what rewards await them. And it has a little bit of that kind of like chorus sing-song delivery that we talked about. If we look at the vernacular and the way in which it's written and who is doing the work, and this sounds like a black-to-black narrative in terms of African-Americans singing a work song. Uh, This is evocative even of the first story in this collection, Carantha, where we had kind of like those uh, slave narrative uh, uh, work songs in the middle of the prose. But Judgment Day. What is it, right? When we talk about this, there is clearly a Christian context in which we could interpret this story and the short story cycle as a whole. But it's meant to be the day where all of your actions in life are judged, right? Like we don't know, we, we pass these ideas of like, what what is good in life? What should I be doing? But it's always within the context of what we can accomplish in life. We have no idea if there's an eternal whether there's an eternal, or whether we actually just become a husk at the end of life. But we're given this rule book called the Bible, if you are Christian. And this rule book says, these are the things that you have to do to live a good life. And here we have the workers that are saying, well, we're not going to wait till that judgment day to get some of these rewards, is how I would interpret this. And it's all very subjective for how we interpret this. But when I look at some of these lines, when they say things such as, come brother, come, let's lift it. Come now, hew it, roll it away. I can't help but think about the myth of Sisyphus. Uh, again, a very subjective interpretation, but you know the idea is that you're rolling this rock uphill only to have it fall down and then you have to roll it up again. It's, it's absurd. It's absurdism of what's the point of rolling this rock? And we take that and apply that in our own lives. What's the point of this suffering? What's the point of all the hard work that we can do? Is there uh, an eternal life at the end or does the rock fall down and that's just the end at life? That's kind of the question that I kind of feel like we need to ask this, particularly in light with how this connects with the previous poem, right? Where the woman was a husk at the end of her life. Was it worth it? Or is it all just absurdism and this is all just work for the sake of work and we're deluding ourselves for value at the end? Why can't we get some of the fruit now, if you will? So when we think about what does that mean that we're not going to wait for, for judgment day? that we want freedom now, particularly when we look at Gene Toomer's life from an autobiographical standpoint, you know, both of his parents were slaves in America and lived through uh, the Civil War and basically the abolishment of slavery, of becoming free Americans, African-American citizens at that point in time. Well, Gene Toomer. And what is this poem, A Love Song to even, in terms of the lives of the people who have worked? Is it to his peoples, to his parents? Is, is freedom meant to be from morality, of being able to have some joy in your life and not expect that there's, you know, this, this reward in the afterlife? Or is it simply a poem about slavery, that we wanted the freedom from slavery, that it's, it's we can't wait for God to have uh, rewards for us, that we should free the black slaves at, at the time when slavery was legal. You know, it's it's hard to know how to interpret that Nestor. Maybe you can share with me how it was explained to you or if you've heard a great explanation on it. But it, it seems very similar to, to Nasser, which is an old Arabic masculine given name given to the grantor of victory, right? And, and those that, that did overcome slavery and did push towards a more free lifestyle even though there obviously was still Jim Crow laws and a lot of racism that happened in America at the time, right? If you're not going to wait for Judgment Day, what are the things that, as a grantor of victory, as a person who throws off the myth of Sisyphus of saying suffering has a meaning, what are you going to do today to free those chains, to make your life a little bit better, and for those around you so that you don't look back when you're an empty husk at the end of your life and regret that your life was it meaningful? That's a good question. <laughs> you certainly wouldn't want to waste it and uh, hope that what goes around comes around, which interestingly enough, the next short story in this short story cycle is called Karma, not spelled the way that Karma would normally, but let's jump into that next.